Psychological horror is the kind of horror that really gets you more than just a jump scare. It's the kind of horror that makes you think and makes you check behind the shower curtain before you go to bed. The kind that gets in your head and makes you question who you are. And I found an iceberg that goes through a bunch of movies in this psychological horror genre and we're gonna talk about those today. I'm actually really excited to talk about this iceberg because I love psychological horror. It's my favorite subgenre of horror and I already see literally my favorite movie ever made on this iceberg, so I'm really hyped. An iceberg is a chart that follows the saying of, oh, that's just the tip of the iceberg, where all the entries closer to the top are just the tip, and they're ones that are very well known and kind of basic and a little boring, but then as we get further down the iceberg, they get a lot darker, a lot more obscure, and a lot more lost. So yeah, without further ado, let's get straight into this video. Also, if you didn't know, I have a Discord, so go ahead and join that. We can hang out, you know, maybe hop into a VC or something, and also, literally, I think it's 99% of every Everybody that watches my videos are not subscribed, which is insane. So go ahead and subscribe if you want to know whenever I post a new video, another iceberg, these kinds of things. Okay, sorry. Anyways, into the video. American Psycho is a psychological thriller film released in 2000, directed by Mary Heron. It's based on Brett Easton Ellis' novel of the same name. The story is set in the late 1980s in Manhattan, and follows the life of Patrick Bateman, a wealthy New York City investment banker. But Patrick isn't just any Wall Street guy, he's also a psychopath who leads a double life as a serial killer. The film opens with Patrick's narration, which offers a glimpse into his superficial, materialistic world. He's obsessed with status, fashion, and outward appearances, meticulously detailing his beauty regime and workout routines. His life seems perfect on the surface. Great job, beautiful fiance, exclusive social circle, literally me, but it's all a facade. As the story progresses, we start seeing the darker side of Patrick. He's emotionally detached, has a lack of empathy, and is increasingly consumed by his violent impulses. The film depicts his descent into madness marked by a series of brutal and bizarre murders. He targets not only those he sees as inferior, but also his colleagues and acquaintances. What's particularly chilling about American Psycho is how it critiques the shallow, self-absorbed culture of the 1980s corporate elite. Patrick is a symbol of this world, a man so consumed by appearances that he loses his humanity. The ending of the film is supposed to be deliberately ambiguous. Supposed to be, at least. After a night of extreme violence, Patrick leaves a message on his lawyer's answering machine, confessing to everything. But when he meets his lawyer the next day, his lawyer doesn't believe him, thinking it's just a joke and says he had dinner with one of Patrick's alleged victims days after his supposed death. The ending is supposed to leave the audience wondering whether Patrick really committed the murders or if they were all in his mind. Okay, I get the story and the cultural phenomenon and all that with this movie, but my hot take is that this movie really isn't that good. This movie is overly edgy to me, and it seems like bait for like, OMG, this is so cool, it's so mysterious and psychological and smart. But to be fair, everything I'm saying might just be because I read the book first and the book is way better. But also, bro, I know I sound like one of those losers who start to piss their pants when anyone watches a Lord of the Rings movie without mentioning, um, well, actually, Tom Bombadil is supposed to be here. But okay, trust me, dude, with this one, the book is actually way better. The book is actually like ambiguous and stuff. It's way better written. It's really psychological and it'll, it's really good. But anyways, the Amityville horror, which first hit the screens in 1979 and was later remade in 2005, is a classic in the horror genre. It's based on a true story, which adds an extra layer of creepiness to the whole thing. So the Amityville horror is centered around the Lutz family. They move into a large house in Amityville, New York, a house where a tragic and brutal crime took place the year before. Ronald DeFeo Jr. had murdered his entire family in that house, claiming he was influenced by voices. Despite knowing the house's history, the Lutzes, eager for a new start, decide to move in. Almost immediately, weird things start happening. The family experiences strange noises, unexplainable cold drafts, and even ghostly apparitions. The house seems to have a mind of its own. The youngest daughter, Missy, even makes an imaginary friend, Jody, a demonic pig-like creature with glowing red eyes. Kinda scary. <laughs> As time passes, the occurrence has become more intense and frightening. George Lutz, the father, undergoes a drastic personality change. He becomes irritable, sick, and starts having nightmares about the murders. It's as if the house's dark past is slowly consuming him, affecting his mental state and behavior. Now let's focus on the psychological horror here. The Amityville horror is a blend of supernatural scares and psychological tension. 
The movie excels in showing how an ordinary family can be pushed to the brink of madness by an unseen malevolent force. It's not just about the jump scares, it's about the gradual unraveling of their sanity. The psychological horror comes from the uncertainty and paranoia that builds up. The family is constantly questioning their reality. Are they really experiencing these supernatural events, or is it all in their heads? This kind of psychological torment is arguably more terrifying than any ghost or demon, really. Towards the end, when the family finally decides to flee the house after a particularly terrifying night, the audience is left to wonder about the true nature of the house. Like, was it haunted by the victims of the tragedy, or was there something darker going on, or was it all in their heads? This one is actually ambiguous. Ooh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, guys, let me level with you all. Black Swan, and technically Baby Driver 2, I can't pick between them, but anyways, Black Swan is my favorite movie ever. This movie is a perfection of film as an art, in my opinion, and I am so glad it's on this iceberg. I low-key might make a full video essay about how perfect this movie is one day. Let me know down in the comments if you guys want to see that. But anyways, okay, let's get straight into the movie. So Black Swan is about a ballerina whose life literally surrounds nothing but ballet. She practices ballet in all her free time, goes to the dance studio every day. This is like all she thinks about. And she is obsessed with being perfect. Like she has to be perfect. Anything less than perfect makes her self-harm and hate herself. And to make this even worse, her mother was an old ballerina who failed. So she places her regret and fear of failure onto her daughter and feeds this desire to only live a life of ballet and nothing else. Her mom coddles her into being like a little girl, but the movie takes a turn when this ballerina decides to live an actual life. This change is so sudden though that she's in complete emotional distress and relief and like madness. This descent into darkness mixed with her still there determination to be perfect makes her life a living hell of psychological torment from everyone around her, including her awful physically, emotionally, and sexually abusive teacher. But anyways, yeah, there's a lot to this movie. There's a scene where pictures of her come to life and stare at her. There's a lot of self-harm. Yeah, I would love to talk more about this in a dedicated video. Let me know if you want that. Okay, moving on. Gerald's Game is a gripping and psychologically intense film adapted from Stephen King's novel of the same name. Released in 2017, it's directed by Mike Flanagan, who's known for his work in the horror genre. So imagine this. Jessie and her husband Gerald go to a secluded lake house, hoping to rekindle their marriage. Things take a wild turn when Gerald handcuffs Jessie to the bed for some, you know, a little bit of fun. But then, bam, he has a heart attack and dies on the spot. Talk about, like, a worst case, like, worst fear <laughs> scenario, right? Now, Jesse's stuck, handcuffed to the bed in the middle of nowhere. Like, they went out to, like, this, like, secluded spot, you know? It's the beginning of a nightmare. From here, it's not just about Jesse trying to figure out how to escape. It's like a deep dive into her mind. She's all alone with nothing but her thoughts. And trust me, her thoughts are pretty intense. She starts having these crazy hallucinations, like talking to an imaginary version of Gerald and even a tougher version of herself. It's like her mind is trying to help her out, but it's also dragging up some really dark stuff from her past. And let me tell you about her past, it's very heavy. The film flashes back to the super disturbing memory of Jesse as a kid during a solar eclipse where her father does something terrible, we'll just say. This moment is huge because it shows why Jessie is the way that she is. It's all about how our past, especially the bad stuff, can stick with us and mess with our heads. Now add to all the psychological drama the appearance of the Moonlight Man, which I think is the man that I saw when I was tripping on DPH last weekend. But this guy is creepy to the max. At first Jessie thinks he's just another hallucination, but then there's a twist. He's actually real. He's this eerie figure who shows up at night, adding a whole layer of horror to an already terrifying situation. What makes Gerald's game so cool and scary is that it's not just about being physically trapped, it's about how we can be trapped by our own memories and fears. Like how you might be trapped right now. Because of your ex who treated you a certain way, and now you think that you need to be treated that way to be happy because you think that's who you are because your ex was everything to you at one point, but now you just completely shield yourself off and you let anybody in and now you only crave that one kind of affirmation from people because that's all you really know. And you won't actually let yourself learn any other kind of love, so then you're depressed because you're not getting that one kind of love because that kind of love was toxic in the end because you guys aren't dating anymore, so it had to be toxic because you aren't together anymore, and now that's all you want, but you know it's bad for you, but you don't even know it's bad for you, but that's all you want, and then you're just depressed forever. Jessie's fighting to get free, but she's also battling her inner demons. This movie does a killer job of mixing survival drama with a deep hey. psychological <clears throat> journey. Alright, let's talk about Get Out, which is honestly a game changer in the horror genre. 
Directed by Jordan Peele and released in 2017, this film is not just a regular horror flick. It's a sharp, smart commentary on racism wrapped up in a seriously creepy story. So the movie follows Chris, a black photographer who's heading to meet the parents of his white girlfriend, Rose, for the first time. They're going to her family's estate and Chris is a bit nervous about how her parents will react to their interracial relationship. But when they get there, her parents seem super welcoming, maybe even a bit too much. Things start getting weird really fast. The parents' overly accommodating behavior feels off, and the black staff at the estate act strangely submissive, almost like they're in a trance. Chris says something is off, but tries to brush it off at first. Okay, now let's talk about the psychological horror here. This movie is a masterclass in building tension and paranoia. Chris keeps noticing more odd things, like all the other black guests behaving bizarrely and his friend Rod warning him over the phone that something seems off. It's that creeping sense of dread where you know something's wrong but can't quite put your finger on it. The big twist is when it turns out that Rose and her family are part of a cult that kidnaps black people to use their bodies for a horrifying form of brain transplantation. The white people in the cult believe they can gain physical and mental advantages by transplanting their consciousness into black bodies, essentially erasing the person inside. This twist takes the film from being a tense thriller to a full-blown horror. Get Out brilliantly uses the horror genre to explore themes of racism, cultural appropriation, and the commodification of black bodies. The psychological horror here is deeply tied to real social issues and anxieties about race and identity. It's like a wake-up call wrapped in a horror film. The film's ending, when Chris fights back and escapes, is really satisfying. It flips the script on usual horror movie tropes and gives a powerful message about breaking free from oppression and reclaiming one's identity. Hereditary is a horror film that seriously gets under your skin, and it's a great one to chat about. Directed by Ari Aster and released in 2018, this movie is not just a regular scare fest. It's a deep dive into grief, family secrets, and some really disturbing supernatural stuff. The story kicks off with the Graham family dealing with the death of the grandmother, Ellen. Annie, the mom, is particularly affected. She's an artist who creates miniature models, often reflecting her own life, which is a cool detail in the film. Annie, her husband Steve, son Peter, and daughter Charlie all start experiencing strange things after Ellen's death. Charlie, who was especially close to Ellen, starts acting weirder than usual. She's an odd kid, always making creepy clicking noises and crafting bizarre figures. Then a shocking and brutal incident happens. No spoilers, but it's seriously jaw-dropping. Which sends the family spiraling into deeper grief and despair. Here's where the psychological horror really kicks in. Annie's grief leads her to a support group where she meets Joan, who introduces her to a seance. Seance? Seance? Seance. Things start to unravel from there. Annie becomes more and more unstable, haunted by visions and the heavy weight of her family's past. The horror of Hereditary is not just about ghosts or demons, it's about the horrors of family trauma. The film explores how past family issues can haunt the present. There's this suffocating atmosphere of dread throughout the movie, like something terrible is always lurking just out of sight. And then there's the supernatural aspect. Without giving too much away, let's just say that the film takes a wild turn into the realm of the occult. It turns out that Ellen, the deceased grandmother, was involved in some dark, mysterious, evil practices that have significant consequences for the whole family. The Innocence is an eerie and atmospheric film that really stands out in the horror genre, especially for its time. Released in 1961 and directed by Jack Clayton, it's based on Henry James's novella The Turn of the Screw. This movie is a classic example of psychological and gothic horror, blending supernatural elements with the inner turmoil of the main character. The story revolves around Miss Giddens, played brilliantly by Deborah Kerr, who becomes the governess to two children, Flora and Miles, at a large, secluded country estate. The children's uncle, who hires Miss Giddens, wants nothing to do with them, giving her full responsibility to their care. Right from the start, the setting is ripe for a haunting story. A sprawling old mansion, isolated in the countryside. Also, I just realized that this is like... that. I don't know if you've seen the Netflix show The Haunting of Bly Manor, but this is like based on like the same book or whatever, I think. That's pretty cool. I love that show. Anyways, Miss Giddens starts to notice strange things around the house and in the behavior of the children. Flora and Miles are unusually close and often behave in ways that seem mature beyond their years. The atmosphere of the house with its shadows and whispers begins to get to Miss Giddens. 
The psychological horror of The Innocents is superb. The film plays a lot with the ideas of perception and reality. Are the ghosts that Miss Giddens sees real or are they figments of her imaginations? Perhaps manifestations of her repressed fears and desires? The film does a fantastic job of keeping you guessing. As the story unfolds, Miss Giddens learns about the estate's tragic past involving the precious governess and a valet, both of whom died under mysterious circumstances. She becomes convinced that the spirits of these two individuals are possessing the children, leading her to take drastic measures to, quote, save them. What's really chilling about The Innocents is how it builds horror through atmosphere and suggestion rather than actual scares or shocks. The black and white cinematography, the use of light and shadows, and the eerie sound design all contribute to a sense of creeping dread. The film also delves into the themes of innocence and corruption. The innocence of the children is constantly in question, and Miss Giddens' own grip on sanity becomes more tenuous as the film progresses. It's a psychological puzzle, with the horror coming as much from what's hinted at and left unsaid as what's shown. Misery is a standout film in the thriller genre, especially for fans who love a good mix of psychological tension and edge-of-your-seat suspense. Released in 1990 and directed by Rob Reiner, it's based on Stephen King's novel of the same name. The movie is a classic example of how a seemingly simple situation can spiral into a horrifying ordeal. The story centers around Paul Sheldon, a successful novelist known for his popular Misery romance series. After finishing his latest manuscript, Paul gets into a car accident during a snowstorm and is rescued by Annie Wilkes, a nurse who happens to be his quote number one fan. At first, Annie seems like a lifesaver. She takes him to her remote home, sets his broken legs, provides him with care. But things take a pretty dark turn quickly. Annie reads Paul's latest manuscript and becomes enraged that he has killed off her favorite character, Misery Chastain. Her obsession with the character in Paul's work reveals her unstable and violent nature. Paul quickly realizes that Annie has no intention of letting him go. What makes Misery so gripping is the psychological interplay between Paul and Annie. Annie is an unpredictable mix of nurturing, caregiver, and unhinged captor. Paul, rendered helpless by his injuries, must use his wits to try to survive. He tries to pacify Annie while planning his escape, leading to a pretty tense cat and mouse game. The film delves deep into the theme of obsession. Annie's love for the Misery series turns into a dangerous fixation, not just on the characters, but on Paul himself. Her behavior illustrates how fan adoration can morph into something sinister and controlling. Kathy Bates delivers an unforgettable performance as Annie, perfectly capturing the character's shifts between sweetly doting to terrifyingly psychotic. James Caan, as Paul, portrays a man pushed to his mental and physical limits with great skill. These two actors do really good here. This movie's really like claustrophobic too, I just wanted to add that, it's like very like claustrophobic. Yo wait, is this the dad from A Christmas Story? Is that James Caan? Sorry, I'm not very uh, cultured with actors, is this- That's the same guy, bro. This is the guy from The Godfather? What? The guy from The Godfather played in A Christmas Story and Misery? No, wait, no, 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 it's not- no, it's Elf I'm thinking of. That's crazy. Anyways. Directed by Alfred Hitchcock, Psycho is a masterpiece of suspense and psychological horror. The story kicks off with Marion Crane, who steals a large sum of money from her employer and hits the road, ending up at the Bates Motel, and this is where things get really interesting. The motel is run by Norman Bates, a seemingly shy and awkward guy who has a very, let's say, complicated relationship with his mother. The most famous scene, you know, the shower scene, is where Marion meets a grisly end, which was a total game changer in terms of movie shockers at the time. The psychological horror in Psycho is all about the exploration of Norman Bates' character. He's got this whole dual personality thing going on, where he's Norman sometimes, but he also takes on the persona of his domineering mother. The twist to the end, revealing Norman's split personality and the true fate of his mother, is one of the most shocking in film history. Directed by Roman Polanski, Rosemary's Baby is a different kind of horror. It's more of a slow burn, focusing on psychological terror and the paranoia of the main character, Rosemary. She and her husband, Guy, move into a New York City apartment with a sinister history. Rosemary becomes pregnant, but the pregnancy is far from normal. She experiences severe pain and craves raw meat, among other odd symptoms. Meanwhile, her nosy neighbors in the Castavets take an unsettling interest in her pregnancy. The horror in Rosemary's Baby is subtle and psychological. It plays on the fear of the unknown and the feeling that something is not quite right. Rosemary's increasing isolation and suspicion towards her husband and her neighbors create a tense atmosphere. 
The climax reveals that her baby is uh, not exactly what she was expecting. No spoilers here, but this movie is also evil. <laughs> the Shining is a total classic in the horror film world. And there's a lot to talk about with this one. Directed by Stanley Kubrick and released in 1980, is based on Stephen King's novel, although Kubrick took some creative liberties with the story here. The movie follows Jack Torrance, who takes a job as the winter caretaker of the isolated Overlook Hotel in the Colorado Rockies. He moves there with his wife Wendy and their young son Danny. Danny possesses The Shining, a psychic ability that lets him see the hotel's horrific past. The hotel itself is like a character in the movie, filled with creepy history and eerie, empty spaces. A whole lot of liminal spaces here. And if you know me, you know I like my liminal spaces. Things start to get weird when the hotel becomes snowbound and isolated from the outside world. Jack, an aspiring writer, becomes increasingly unstable, influenced by the malevolent forces within the hotel. The iconic line, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, really sums up his descent into madness here. The psychological horror in The Shining is top-notch. There's this constant sense of unease and tension. The isolation of the hotel plays into it, creating a claustrophobic feeling. You can almost feel the walls closing in. The movie does an incredible job of making you question what's real and what's a product of Jack's unraveling mind. Danny's visions add another layer of horror. The twins in the hallway, the blood gushing from the elevator, and the mysterious room 231. These images are super chilling and have become iconic in horror cinema. One of the most striking things about The Shining is its use of visuals and music to create an atmosphere of dread. The long, steady shots of the hotel's corridors, the haunting soundtrack, it all builds this feeling of impending doom. Jack Nicholson's performance as Jack Torrance is unforgettable. He captures the gradual decline into madness perfectly. Shelley Duvall, as Wendy, portrays the growing terror and desperation as she realizes her husband has become a threat. This movie is, I mean, it's, it's popular for a reason, you know? Directed by M. Night Shyamalan, The Sixth Sense is a film that has really made an impact with its plot twist. The story follows a young boy named Cole who has a chilling secret. He can see and communicate with the dead. He's terrified and doesn't understand why he has this ability. Enter Dr. Malcolm Crow, a child psychologist played by Bruce Willis. He tries to help Cole deal with his fears and his unique gift. The film beautifully captures the struggle of a child trying to navigate a world that's just too scary for him to understand. The psychological horror in The Sixth Sense comes from the way it portrays the ghosts and Cole's interactions with them. It's not just the jump scares, it's the deep, underlying horror of a child facing something so out of the ordinary. And then there's the famous twist ending that, I don't know, should I spoil it? Should I spoil it for you guys? I don't know. Um, um, double tap if you don't want to hear the twist ending. Dr. Crow himself is a ghost, having been killed in the opening first scene. So the twist only not shocks, but also redefines the entire narrative adding a whole new layer to the film's exploration of grief and acceptance. Split, another film by Shyamalan, delves into the world of psychological thrillers with a touch of the supernatural. The film focuses on Kevin, a man with 23 different personalities, played by James McAvoy. Kevin kidnaps three teenage girls, and as they try to escape, they encounter several of his personalities, each more disturbing than the last. The psychological aspect of Split is intense. It explores the complexities of dissociative identity disorder, though in a very Hollywood way, and its impact on Kevin's psyche. The suspense comes from them not knowing which personality will take control next and how it'll affect the girl's chances of escaping. The film is a lead up to the emergence of this thing called The Beast, a superhuman 24th personality. Split is a tense, unsettling journey into the mind of a deeply troubled individual. Directed by Roman Polanski, Repulsion is a classic psychological horror film. It's a story about Carol, played by Catherine Deneuve, a young woman living in London who descends into madness when left alone in her apartment. Repulsion is an intense exploration of a woman's psyche. Carol is disturbed by her sexual desires and fears, leading to hallucinations and a complete break from reality. The film's horror comes from its depiction of Carol's mental disintegration. The apartment becomes a claustrophobic space reflecting her mental state, with cracks appearing in the walls and hands reaching out to grab her. The film doesn't rely on traditional horror elements, but rather on the psychological unraveling of its protagonist, Carol. Ooh, okay, Midsummer is a fascinating and unique entry in the horror genre. Directed by Ari Aster and released in 2019, the film takes a different approach to horror, setting most of its story in broad daylight in a seemingly idyllic Swedish village. But don't let the sunny scenery fool you. Midsummer is as unsettling and disturbing as they come. 
The story follows a young woman named Danny who is grieving the tragic loss of her family. Accompanied by her boyfriend Christian and his friends, she travels to Sweden. Is that a Blade reference? Plastic surgery, Echo 2 Cavers? Fly Norwegian, then we go back to Sweden? Is that song about Midsummer? To attend a Midsummer festival in a rural village. One of Christian's friends is doing his thesis on Midsummer traditions, and they're all expecting a peaceful cultural experience. However, things start to get pretty wild quickly. The village's traditions are bizarre and increasingly horrifying. What starts as a quaint and colorful festival soon reveals itself to be something much darker and more sinister. One of the most interesting aspects of Midsummer is how it plays with the horror genre's conventions. The terror doesn't lurk in the shadows here, it's right out in the open, in the light of day, which somehow makes it even more disturbing. The psychological horror in Midsummer comes from its exploration of grief, relationships, and the human need for belonging. Danny's story is particularly poignant. She's dealing with immense personal loss, and her relationship with Christian is strained and unsatisfying. The cult-like village offers her a sense of belonging and acceptance, but at a horrifying cost. The film is visually stunning, with bright colors and beautiful landscapes, which creates a stark contrast with the dark, violent events of the story. It's this juxtaposition that makes Midsummer so effective and unsettling. Ari Esther does a fantastic job of building a sense of dread and unease, leading to some truly shocking moments. The rituals and customs of the village, while initially intriguing, become more and more disturbing as the film progresses. The Lighthouse is a really intriguing and atmospheric film, directed by Robert Eggers. <laughs> Robert Eggers. <laughs> and released in 2019. It's quite different from your typical horror movie. Set in the late 19th century is about two lighthouse keepers, Thomas Wake and Ephraim Winslow, who are stationed on a remote and mysterious New England island. Willem Dafoe plays Thomas, the grizzled veteran keeper, and Robert Pattinson plays Ephraim. Eph Ephraim? Ephraim? Eph How do you pronounce that, dude? Ephraim? Guys, I promise I've actually seen this one. Like, I've actually seen this movie. I guess I'm just stupid. I don't- I can't hear. Okay. Anyways, Robert Pattinson plays Ephraim, the younger man who's new to the job. The film is shot in black and white with a nearly square aspect ratio, which gives it this claustrophobic and timeless feel. It's like watching an old photograph come to life. As the story unfolds, the two men face not just the harsh elements, but also their own sanity, or lack thereof. They're isolated, the work is tough, and they start to drink heavily. This is where the psychological horror kicks in. The film blurs the lines between reality and hallucination, leaving you unsure what's real and what's not. Thomas is domineering and superstitious, constantly telling tales of sea lore and keeping the lighthouse's light to himself. Ephraim, on the other hand, starts having visions and nightmares, some involving mermaids and eerie sea-related horrors. His obsession with the lighthouse's light grows, as does his suspicion and animosity towards Thomas. The tension between the two men escalates into paranoia, hostility, and violence. Their descent into madness is portrayed in a way that's both terrifying and mesmerizing. The film is filled with symbolism and ambiguous scenes that can be interpreted in many ways. It's like a fever dream with elements of really cool mythology and folklore woven in. The performances by Defoe and Pattinson are phenomenal. They really sell the descent into madness and the claustrophobic, tense atmosphere of the film. The dialogue, which is inspired by period writings, adds to the authenticity and eerie quality of the movie. This one's really awesome and good. Perfect Blue is a Japanese animated psychological thriller directed by Satoshi Khan. This film is a wild ride into the blurred lines between reality and illusion, and is especially notable for its exploration of identity and the dark side of fame. The story centers around Mima Kerigo, a member of a J-pop idol group who decides to leave singing to pursue an acting career. As she delves into her new role, which includes some controversial scenes, she becomes the target of a stalker and starts receiving threatening messages. Things get really twisted when she begins to lose her grip on reality, struggling to distinguish between her life and the roles that she plays. Perfect Blue delves deep into themes like the objectification of women in the entertainment industry, the impact of media on personal identity, and the dangers of fan obsession. The psychological horror comes from Mima's disintegrating sense of self. As her paranoia and disorientation grow, the film masterfully blurs the lines between her experiences and hallucinations, leading the audience questioning what's real. 
the animation style enhances the story's unsettling and surreal nature. It's a film that's both a critique of the entertainment industry and a complex exploration of identity, perception, and the cost of fame. The Babadook is a fascinating and deeply psychological horror film. Directed by Jennifer Kent and released in 2014, it's become quite a standout in the genre for its clever blend of real-life fears and supernatural elements. The story revolves around Amelia, a widow who's struggling to raise her son, Samuel, on her own. Samuel is a troubled child, plagued by fears of monsters and an obsession with building homemade weapons to fight them. Their relationship is strained, to say the least. Enter the Babadook. It starts with a mysterious children's book that appears in their home, titled Mr. Babadook. The book is creepy, with dark, foreboding illustrations and a sinister rhyme that warns of the Babadook, a shadowy, malevolent entity. Samuel becomes convinced that the Babadook is real and is terrorizing them. The real horror in the Babadook isn't just the spooky entity itself, it's how the film uses the Babadook as a metaphor for grief and unresolved trauma. Amelia is still reeling from the death of her husband, who died in a car crash while driving her to the hospital to give birth to Samuel. Her unresolved grief and resentment towards Samuel manifest as the Babadook. As the story progresses, the Babadook becomes more and more oppressive, mirroring Amelia's descent into despair and anger. The film is really effective at building this atmosphere of dread and tension, not just with jump scares, but through the psychological turmoil of the characters. The film's style contributes to this unsettling feel. The color palette is muted, the house feels claustrophobic, and there's a constant sense of unease. The Babadook itself, when it appears, is genuinely creepy, with a sort of old-school horror vibe. One of the most compelling aspects of the Babadook is its exploration of the darker aspects of parenthood, and the challenge of coping with loss. It's a horror movie that resonates on a deeply emotional level, which is somewhat rare for the genre. The ending of the film is particularly interesting, offering a more nuanced take on how we deal with our inner demons. Rather than a straightforward vanquishing of the monster, it suggests that some horrors, like grief, are not so easily dismissed and must be acknowledged and lived with. Released in 1920, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is a silent horror film directed by Robert Ween, and is one of the earliest and most influential examples of German expressionist cinema. This film is known for its twisted visual style and its pioneering role of the horror genre. The plot revolves around Dr. Caligari, a sinister hypnotist who uses a sleepwalker named Caesar to commit murders. The film is told through a framing narrative, where the main character Francis recounts the bizarre and tragic events that have unfolded. The film is visually striking with its distorted and dreamlike sets that reflect the character's twisted mental states. The jagged lines, sharp angles, and the exaggerated shadows create an unsettling, otherworldly atmosphere. This style reflects the inner turmoil and madness of the characters, making it a landmark in visual storytelling. The cabinet of Dr. Caligari is often interpreted as a metaphor for the authoritarian control of the German government in the post-World War I era. The film plays with themes of control, manipulation, and the blurred line between sanity and madness. Directed by Nicholas Roeg, Don't Look Now is a British film that is often hailed for its innovative editing and use of symbolism. The movie is based on a short story by Daphne du Maurier and is set in Venice, which serves as a hauntingly beautiful and eerie backdrop. The story centers around John and Laura Baxter, played by Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie, who are grieving the accidental death of their young daughter. They travel to Venice, where John is helping restore an old church, and while there, they meet two sisters, one of whom claims to be psychic and in contact with her deceased daughter. The film masterfully blends the grief and trauma of the couple with a series of mysterious and supernatural events. There's a serial killer on the loose in Venice, adding to the atmosphere of dread. The city's labyrinth canals and narrow streets create a claustrophobic feeling of being trapped. Don't Look Now is known for its non-linear narrative and the way it builds suspense and a sense of foreboding. The use of recurring motifs like the color red and the fragmented editing style contribute to the unsettling feeling. The climax of the film, with its shocking twist, is both haunting and tragic, leaving a lasting impact. Let's Scare Jessica to Death is a lesser-known but equally compelling entry in the psychological horror genre. 
Directed by John Hancock, it's a story that blurs the line between reality and hallucination, creating an eerie and disorienting experience. The film follows Jessica, who has recently been released from a mental institution. She moves to a secluded farmhouse with her husband and a friend in an attempt to start a new peaceful life. However, they soon find out that they're not alone. A mysterious woman named Emily is living in the house, and they invite her to stay with them. Jessica begins to experience strange, ghostly visions and hears voices, making her, and the audience, question her sanity. The film plays with themes of paranoia and isolation and the fragility of the mind. The rural setting with its autumn landscape and eerie lakes adds to the film's haunting mood. Let's Scare Jessica to Death has a dreamlike, almost surreal quality to it. It's a film that's more about creating a mood and a feeling of unease than about outright scares. The ambiguity of what's real and what's a product of Jessica's troubled mind makes it a fascinating watch. The Pix, also known as La Lunoul in French. The Pix is a Canadian supernatural thriller directed by Harvey Hart. The film is somewhat of a hidden gem in the genre, known for its moody atmosphere and complex narrative structure. So this one's for the smart people, I guess. <laughs> the story revolves around the investigation into the death of Elizabeth Lucy, a woman who falls from a high-rise building. Christopher Plummer plays Detective Henderson, who unravels the mystery behind her death. As he delves deeper, he discovers connections to occult practices and a mysterious object called a Pix. What's interesting about the Pix is its non-linear storytelling. The film interweaves flashbacks of Elizabeth's life, played by Karen Black, with the ongoing investigation. This structure gradually reveals her involvement with the sinister cult and her struggles with drug addiction. The psychological aspect of the Pix lies in its exploration of themes like control, manipulation, and the dark underbelly of society. The film combines elements of a police procedural with supernatural horror, creating a unique and unsettling atmosphere. Directed by Jonathan Demme, The Silence of the Lambs is a critically acclaimed psychological horror thriller, famous for its intense narrative and compelling characters. The film is based on Thomas Harris's novel of the same name and is part of the Hannibal Lecter series, apparently. The story follows Clara Starling, an FBI trainee, played by Jodie Foster, who is tasked with capturing a serial killer known as Buffalo Bill. To understand the mind of the killer, she seeks the help of Dr. Hannibal Lecter, a brilliant psychiatrist and cannibalistic serial killer, portrayed by Anthony Hopkins in a very super iconic performance. The Silence of the Lambs is renowned for its psychological depth. The interactions between Claris and Lecter are central to the film, creating a tense and captivating dynamic. Lecter's manipulation and insight in Claris' psyche adds a chilling layer to their conversations. The film masterfully blends elements of horror, suspense, and crime with really like deep themes and stuff, you know? This one's like really famous, like a big standout in the genre. Directed by Robert Zemix, What Lies Beneath is a supernatural thriller starring Michelle Pfeiffer and Harrison Ford. The story revolves around Claire Spencer, who begins to experience disturbing supernatural occurrences in her home. As she delves deeper, Claire suspects that the spirit haunting her may be connected to her husband, Norman, and his mysterious past. The film is a mix of classic ghost story elements with a psychological twist. It does a great job of building suspense and tension, using a combination of visual and auditory cues to make an eerie atmosphere. The psychological aspect of the film lies in Claire's unraveling of the mystery, her growing paranoia, and the gradual reveal of Norman's secrets. Be My Cat, a film for Anne, is an independent Romanian found footage horror film directed and starring Adrian Tofei, who plays an aspiring filmmaker obsessed with actress Anne Hathaway. The film is unique in its approach, blending reality with fiction really like disturbingly. Tofei's character is making a film to convince Hathaway to star in his movie, and he goes to extreme lengths, including kidnapping and terrorizing real actresses to achieve authenticity. Be My Cat is a deeply unsettling exploration of obsession, delusion, and the blurred line between art and reality. The film's found footage style adds to its realism and intensity, making the viewer complicit in the protagonist's increasingly unhinged behavior. It's a low-budget film that manages to create a significant impact through its raw, unfiltered portrayal of a disturbed mind. Directed by M. Night Shyamalan, The Visit is a found footage style horror film that follows two young siblings, Becca and Tyler, who go to stay with their grandparents for a week. 
However, their grandparents' strange and increasingly disturbing behavior starts to frighten them. The film effectively uses the found footage format to create a sense of realism and immediacy. The children's perspective adds to the sense of vulnerability and unease. This one's like a really good build-up, and then it has a classic twist ending like every Shyamalan film, you know. Whoa, we finished layer one, guys. I hope y'all are excited for this for this iceberg. W W W Riz. Ohio Gaia, am I right guys? Let's get into layer two. 1408 is one of those films that really gets under your skin in the best way possible. It's about this author, Mike Inslin, played by John Cusack, who's made a career out of debunking supernatural myths. He decides to test his skepticism by spending a night in the Dolphins Hotel Room 1408, a room with a notorious reputation and a string of unexplained deaths. The hotel manager, brilliantly portrayed by Samuel L. Jackson, warns him against it, but Mike's curiosity wins out. What follows is a psychological roller coaster that blurs the line between reality and illusion. Delving into Mike's personal traumas and fears, it's fascinating to see how the film uses the haunted room as a metaphor for confronting inner demons, and the ending leaves you with plenty to ponder about what's real and what's not. Okay, there's Creep, and there's its sequel, Creep 2. These are a bit different as they use the found footage style to ramp up the tension. In the first movie, we meet Aaron, a videographer who takes a job filming a guy named Joseph who claims to be dying. But Joseph, he's a character that you really can't quite figure out. He's played with unsettling charm by Mark Duplass, and he makes you oscillate between sympathy and suspicion. It's pretty cool. The sequel, Creep 2, takes it up a notch, exploring the antagonist's psyche more deeply and throwing in some darkly comedic elements. These ones are pretty good. I remember I saw, I think I saw Creep 2 for the first time, like at a Halloween party, and it was really boring. But I've changed, I've changed my mind since then. It was probably just because I was at a party surrounded by a bunch of people. Good Night, Mommy is another standout. It's in this isolated, almost dreamlike countryside, focusing on twin boys who begin to suspect that their mother, returning home from a cosmetic surgery, might not actually be their mother. The film brilliantly plays with themes of identity and trust. It's eerie and unsettling, building this incredible tension that keeps you guessing. And when the truth finally unfolds, it's both shocking and thought-provoking. The kind of twist that makes you see the entire film in a new light. Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, is a chilling and controversial film. Even by horror standards. Released in 1986, it's loosely based on the real-life serial killer Henry Lee Lucas. The film stars Michael Rooker, who delivers a hauntingly detached performance as Henry. What sets this film apart is its raw, unflinching approach to the subject matter. It doesn't romanticize or glamorize the killings, instead it presents them in a stark, almost documentary-like manner. This realism makes the film profoundly unsettling. The director, John McNaughton, crafts a narrative that delves into the psyche of the serial killer. Exploring themes of violence and the nature of evil is a film that doesn't shy away from showing the banality and brutality of its subject, leaving a lasting impact on its audience. It Comes at Night, directed by Trey Edward Schultz, is a masterclass in atmospheric psychological horror. Released in 2017, the film is set in a post-apocalyptic world where a mysterious illness has ravaged society. The story centers around two families forced together for survival, but the real horror comes from the paranoia and mistrust among them. What's particularly striking about this film is its use of claustrophobic settings and the constant feeling of dread it evokes. It's less about the horror that comes in the night and more about the horror within us. The fear, the suspicion, the desperation. The film is beautifully shot with a focus on dark, moody lighting and tight framing that adds to the overall sense of unease. It's a psychological thriller that leaves a lot to the imagination, which in many ways makes it all the more terrifying. Released in 2019, The Lodge is a film that slowly but surely gets under your skin. Directed by Veronica Franz and Severin Fiela, it's a story about a soon-to-be stepmother, Grace, played by Riley Coe, who gets snowed in at a remote lodge with her fiancé's two children. The setting is claustrophobic and the atmosphere is thick with tension. The film cleverly uses the icy, isolated environment to mirror the characters' emotional states. As the days pass, a lot of strange things start to happen. The film delves into themes of mental illness, guilt, and grief, and what makes The Lodge particularly unnerving is its slow burn approach. It really takes its time building the characters in the eerie atmosphere before diving into the really scary aspects of the story. And the performances are pretty top-notch. This, this one gets a W, a W Riz from me. Orphan is a psychological thriller that came out in 2009 and quickly became notorious for its shocking twist. 
The film centers around a couple played by Vera Farmiga and Peter Sarsgaard, who adopt a nine-year-old girl named Esther after losing their own child. Esther, portrayed brilliantly by Isabel Furman, initially appears sweet and intelligent, but soon her disturbing and violent behavior comes to light. The film excels in building suspense and a sense of unease. Director Jean Colette Serra skillfully uses the character of Esther to explore themes of loss, family, and what happens when trust within a family unit is broken. The movie's twist, which I won't spoil here, is one of those jaw-dropping moments in cinema that completely changes your perspective on everything you've watched before. Pearl is a bit of a unique entry in the horror genre. Released in 2020, it's a character-driven psychological thriller that focuses on the titular character, a young woman grappling with her oppressive life on a family farm. What makes Pearl stand out is its almost dreamlike quality, blending elements of horror with a coming-of-age narrative. Director Ty West creates a slow-burning tension that explores themes of isolation and desire and the darker sides of ambition and aspiration. The film is visually striking, using vibrant colors and a rural setting to create a contrast between the beauty of the world and the darkness lurking within the protagonist. It's a story that says much about the horrors we create for ourselves as it is about any external threat. Silent Night, Deadly Night is a classic in the slasher genre. Released in 1984, it's known for its controversial depiction of a killer Santa Claus, which caused quite a stir upon its release. The film tells the story of a young boy who, after witnessing the murder of his parents by a man in a Santa suit, grows up with psychological scars. When he's forced to dress as Santa for his job, his trauma is triggered and he goes on a killing spree. This film mixes traditional slasher elements with psychological horror, delving into the impact of childhood trauma. Its blend of holiday cheer and horror makes it a unique, if unsettling, viewing experience, particularly during the Christmas season. And if you guys think this is interesting about this Christmas thing, you know, stick around because later this month with the holidays coming in, there might be an iceberg coming out that you might like. Smile, released in 2021, is a psychological horror film that stands out for its intriguing premise. The story follows a therapist who begins experiencing terrifying and unexplainable occurrences after witnessing a traumatic event involving one of her parents. The film effectively uses the motif of a smile, something you know generally associated with happiness, as a symbol of horror, creating a chilling contrast. Now, director Parker Finn skillfully builds a narrative that explores themes of trauma, mental illness, and the fear of losing one's mind. The film's tension comes as much from the protagonist's psychological unraveling as it does from the supernatural elements making it a gripping and unsettling watch. Released in 2021, Last Night in Soho is a stylish psychological thriller directed by Edgar Wright. Now, if you were paying attention earlier, you know that I said my favorite movie of all time is either Black Swan or Baby Driver. And Baby Driver was also directed by Edgar Wright, so you know I gotta love this movie. Anyways, this film follows a young, aspiring fashion designer who mysteriously finds herself transported back to the 1960s where she encounters an aspiring singer. However, the glamour of the era soon gives way to its darker underbelly. What's compelling about this film is how it blends different genres. It's part thriller, part horror, and part time travel narrative. The visual style is striking with vibrant colors and elaborate set pieces that capture the essence of the 60s. The film delves into themes of nostalgia, obsession, and the sometimes harrowing reality behind the allure for the past. This, this, one, this one's really good. This one's just a really, really good movie, bro. <laughs> it's shot so well. Edgar Wright's such a genius, bro. Saint Maud, a 2019 release, is a psychological horror film that delves deep into the realm of religious fervor and obsession. The story revolves around a hospice nurse, Maud, who becomes obsessed with, with saving the soul of her dying patient. What's particularly striking about this film is its exploration of loneliness and faith, and kind of a, a criticism of how some people can like, come on to faith and treat it. Director Rose Glass creates an atmosphere that's both intimate and unnerving, and the film is a slow burn, gradually building tension and unease, culminating in a shocking finale. And the performance of Maud is amazing, um, it's morphid Clark, but it's really good. Now, obviously not all religion is like this, I don't want to come across like I'm saying that. Um, I am a devout Christian, and if you're watching this, Jesus loves you, because Jesus died for everybody who ever lived and it's never too late to turn to him and get the rest he promises. But anyways, let's get let's get on to Orphan First Kill, bro. Orphan First Kill is a prequel to the original Orphan, delving into the backstory of the enigmatic Esther. 
This film adds layers to Esther's character, revealing more about her origins and the events that led up to the first film. It maintains the chilling atmosphere from the first movie, but it adds a fresh perspective by exploring Esther's manipulative nature and her ability to deceive those around her. The film cleverly plays with audience expectations, especially for those familiar with the original, and provides a new twist on the character that keeps viewers on edge. Deranged is a lesser known gem in the psychological horror genre. This film, often hailed for its realism, explores the descent into madness. It's noted for its gritty portrayal of mental illness and its impact. The film's strength lies in its ability to create a deeply unsettling atmosphere without relying on traditional horror tropes. It's a dive into the human psyche, and it's just like a guy going insane, you know? It's really, really interesting and just like gritty and like dark and you can, it's like almost like, what's the word, tangible, you know? It's just really just like, you know, like, like gruff. Cube is a unique blend of psychological horror and science fiction. The premise is fascinating. A group of strangers find themselves trapped in a maze of deadly cube-shaped rooms. The film is a study in human behavior under extreme stress, with the characters trying to navigate the traps and figure out why they've been chosen to be there. It's claustrophobic, tense, and keeps you guessing with its clever plot twists. Cube stands out for its minimalist setting and focus on the psychological dynamics between the characters, making it a lot more personal and kind of like unique. Book of Shadows Blair Witch 2 is a sequel to the groundbreaking The Blair Witch Project, but it takes a different approach. Instead of the found footage style of the original, it opts for a more traditional narrative structure, focusing on a group of people obsessed with the lore of the Blair Witch. The film explores the impact of the first film on these characters and, and delves into themes of obsession, the blurring of reality and fiction, and the dark side of fandom. It received mixed reviews, but is interesting for its meta-commentary on the phenomenon of the first film and the psychological effects of it. The Ring 2 is the sequel to the successful The Ring, continuing the story of the cursed videotape that brings death to its viewers. The film attempts to deepen the mythology of the original, focusing more on the backstory of the eerie girl Samura and her impact on the lives of the main characters. While it retains the creepy atmosphere of the first film, The Ring 2 delves more into psychological horror, exploring themes of motherhood, protection, and the links that one would go to to save their child. It's a film that tries to expand on the eerie, unsettling world created in the first movie. A Tale of Two Sisters is a South Korean psychological horror film that is both beautiful and haunting. The story revolves around two sisters who return home after a stint in a mental hospital and face disturbing occurrences involving their stepmother and the dark history of their house. The film is a masterful blend of horror, drama, and psychological thriller, with, with a heavy emphasis on atmosphere and visual storytelling. It's known for its complex narrative, rich with symbolism and twists that challenge the viewer's perception of reality. Knock at the Cabin is a pretty recent addition to the psychological horror genre. The film stands out for its tense, claustrophobic setting and its exploration of apocalyptic themes. Centered around a family vacationing in a remote cabin, the story takes a dark turn when they are confronted by strangers with a disturbing message and a terrifying ultimatum. The film delves into themes of paranoia, survival, and the psychological toll of extreme moral dilemmas. It's a movie that combines elements of home invasion terror with a broader, more existential threat. This one's really cool. This one, this one has, um, ah, oh, the guy from Mindhunter. Oh, Jonathan Groff. Yeah, that guy. That guy. Whoa, okay, that was layer two. Let's get into layer three, guys. Who's excited? All right, Delirium is a psychological horror film that delves into the mind-building realm of insanity and perception. It's about a character who is recently released from a mental institution who inherits a mansion that may or may not be haunted. The film plays brilliantly with the concept of reality versus delusion, keeping the audience guessing what's real. This is one where you don't really know what's going on and you're not really supposed to, you know? Escape Room is a thrilling psychological horror film that taps into the popular escape room craze, but with a deadly twist. It follows a group of people who are invited to an exclusive escape room experience, only to find out the rooms are designed with elaborate and lethal traps. The film is clever with its puzzle design and the way it develops its characters, each harboring secrets that slowly unravel. It's a high-stakes, adrenaline-pumping movie that combines elements of suspense, mystery, and survival horror. As a sequel to Escape Room, Escape Room Tournament of Champions ups the ante by bringing several survivors of previous escape rooms together. They find themselves trapped in a new series of even more elaborate and dangerous rooms. 
The film continues the trend of the first movie with inventive and deadly puzzles, but it also dives deeper into the backstory of the escape rooms and their creators. The sequel is a fast-paced, tension-filled journey that explores themes of trauma, resilience, and the human instinct for survival under extreme conditions. The Girl Next Door is a horroring psychological horror film based on true events. It tells the story of a young girl who is tortured and abused by her caregiver and the caregiver's children. The film is deeply disturbing, not just for its graphic depiction of abuse, but also for the psychological manipulation and group dynamics it portrays. It's a brutal examination of human cruelty and the capacity for violence in seemingly ordinary people. The film challenges viewers by presenting the darkest sides of humanity and the horrifying realities of abuse and power dynamics. Okay, this film, despite its title, is a standalone story separate from the original The Haunting in Connecticut. Set in rural Georgia, it followed a family who moves into a historic home only to discover this haunted by the spirits tied to the area's dark past. The film blends traditional ghost story elements with southern gothic atmosphere, creating an eerie, tension-filled experience. It explores themes of history, family secrets, and the intersection of the past and the present. The film's strength lies in its ability to create a creepy and unsettling atmosphere while delving into the ghosts of history, both literal and metaphorical. Ma is a psychological horror film that combines elements of a thriller with a darkly comedic edge. It stars Octavia Spencer as Sue Ann, a middle-aged woman who, who befriends a group of teenagers, allowing them to party in her basement. However, her hospitality soon turns into obsession and terror. The film is notable for Spencer's performance, which brings depth to the character's pretty, you know, twisted motivations. Ma explores themes of revenge, trauma, and the desire for acceptance, all wrapped in a story that oscillates between being disturbing and surprisingly empathetic towards its antagonist. Mother is a highly metaphorical and allegorical film that defies traditional genre categorization, but fits comfortably within psychological horror. The film, starring Jennifer Lawrence and Javier Bardem, is set in a remote house where the couple's relationship is tested by the arrival of mysterious guests. The narrative is rich in symbolism and open to various interpretations, often viewed as a commentary of creation, destruction, and the artist's relationship with their creations and destructions and like with their audience too. Mother is known for its intense claustrophobic atmosphere and the increasingly surreal and disturbing events that unfold, making it a divisive yet undeniably impactful film. The Night House is a 2020 psychological horror film that masterfully blends grief, the supernatural, and a haunting atmosphere. The story revolves around a widow played by Rebecca Hall, unraveling the mysterious circumstances surrounding her, her husband's sudden death. The film is praised for its exploration of themes like grief, loneliness, and the unknown, all while maintaining a deep, unsettling tone. Paul's performance is a standout, bringing a raw, emotional depth to the horror. The film cleverly uses the architecture of the house itself as a metaphor, creating a sense of disorientation and claustrophobia that really adds to that psychological tension as well. The Perfection, released in 2018, is a psychological horror thriller known for its shocking twists and turns. The story follows a troubled musical prodigy who seeks out the new star pupil of her former school, leading to a sinister path of jealousy, obsession, and revenge. The film is a roller coaster of suspense and unexpected developments, constantly challenging the audience's perceptions. It's a bold and disturbing exploration of the dark side of ambition and the destructive nature of perfectionism, set against the backdrop of the high-pressure world of classical music. The Stepfather, a 1987 psychological thriller, is a chilling portrayal of suburban horror. It centers on a man who marries widows and divorcees with children, seeking the perfect family, but turns to murder when they disappoint him. The film is a suspenseful exploration of the facade of normalcy and the dangers that can lurk behind seemingly ordinary people. It's particularly noted for its commentary on family dynamics and the societal obsession with outward appearances. The tension in this film builds really, really well as the stepfather's true nature becomes more and more evident. It's really like a nice progression, you know? The Strangers, released in 2008, is a home invasion horror film that stands out for its simplicity and effectiveness. The plot revolves around a couple staying in a remote vacation home who are terrorized by three masked assailants. The film's horror comes from its realism and the randomness of the violence. The attackers have no apparent motive beyond the thrill of instilling fear. 
It's a study in suspense and the primal fear of being hunted with a constant looming threat that feels all too real. The minimalistic approach and the use of tension rather than gore makes it a memorable entry in this genre. Willard is a unique blend of horror and psychological drama, focusing on a socially awkward man who befriends and trains rats to exact revenge on those who have wronged him. The film, both in its original 1971 version and the 2003 version, is noted for its character study of a lonely and troubled individual pushed to the brink. It's a tale of isolation, vengeance, and the unlikely bond between a man and some rats by humanizing his protagonist while simultaneously delving into his descent into madness. Funny Games, both the 1997 original and its 2007 shot-for-shot -shot remake, is a psychological thriller that breaks the fourth wall and challenges the conventions of the genre. The film follows two young men who take a family hostage and then torture them with sadistic games. What makes Funny Games stand out is its critique of violence in media and the audience's role in consuming such content. So it's kind of like a gotcha movie almost, where it's like the movie's thing is like people shouldn't be watching much like violence or as much violence and stuff. But then the movie itself is very violent, you know. So it's saying like you're part of the problem if you watched it, kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. The film is intentionally discomforting, forcing viewers to confront their own voyeurism and the ethics of watching violence for entertainment. Hatching is a pretty recent addition to the psychological horror genre. It's a story that blends elements of body horror with a coming of age narrative. The film explores themes of mother-daughter relationships, societal pressures, and the monstrous nature of suppressed emotions and desires. It's known for its surreal imagery and the unsettling transformation of this young protagonist, creating a disturbing yet poignant tale of growing up and facing one's own inner demons. The Belko Experiment is a 2016 film that combines psychological horror with elements of a thriller. Set in a high-rise corporate office in Bogota, Colombia, the story revolves around the employees who are forced into a deadly game of kill or be killed by an unknown entity. The film explores the darkest aspects of human nature when faced with life and death decisions. It's a brutal, fast-paced movie that delves into themes of morality, survival, and the breakdown of societal norms under extreme pressure. Yo, Lair 3 is over, guys. Let's get into Lair 4. Now, Better Watch Out is one of those films that turns a typical holiday horror on its head. It starts out like a classic home invasion flick set during Christmas, but then it throws in a twist that totally flips the script. The movie revolves around a babysitter protecting her charge from intruders, but trust me, it's not your run-of-the-mill thriller. It's clever, darkly funny, and has some shocking moments that make you rethink the whole innocent child trope. Plus, it really plays around with various movie cliché, like horror movie clichés, in a way that's both refreshing and unsettling. Christmas Evil is a cult classic in the holiday horror genre. It's more than just a guy in a Santa suit going on a rampage. It's a deep dive into the mind of a man obsessed with Christmas and his gradual descent into madness. The film is surprisingly character-driven, offering a sympathetic, if unsettling, look at its main character. It blends psychological horror with dark humor and a bit of social commentary, making it stand out from the typical slasher fare. Flatliners, whether we talk about the original or the remake, is a pretty thrilling mix of psychological and supernatural horror. The premise revolves around medical students experimenting with near-death experiences, which results in some unexpected and terrifying consequences, as you can probably assume. What's compelling about Flatliners is its exploration of life, death, and what might lie beyond. It's also really visually striking and like visually appealing, and it kind of goes above and beyond for what a horror movie really needs. Frozen is a chilling survival horror about three friends who get stranded on a ski lift. It's a simple premise, but the execution is incredibly effective. The film does a great job of creating tension and a sense of dread, as the characters face not just the cold and the height, but also some unexpected threats. It's a testament to how a minimal setting can be used to maximum effect in creating psychological horror. Maniac is one of those films that stays with you long after you've watched it. It's a gritty, first-person perspective look into the mind of a serial killer. Both the original 1980 film and the 2012 remake with Elijah Wood offer a disturbingly intimate portrait of madness and violence. It's unsettling not just because of the graphic content, but because of how it makes you feel almost complicit in the protagonist's actions. The film is a deep dive into the psyche of a disturbed individual, and it's executed in a way that's both pretty artistic and deeply horrifying. May is a unique horror film that's as much a character study as it is a horror story. 
The movie follows a socially awkward young woman whose attempts at connecting with others take a dark and twisted turn. It's a bit of a slow burn, but it masterfully builds up to its climax to the end. The film explores themes of loneliness, alienation, and the extreme lengths one might go to to find acceptance. Unsane is a psychological thriller that's notable for being shot entirely on an iPhone, which adds a gritty, claustrophobic feel to the film. It tells the story of a woman who's involuntarily committed to a mental institution and begins to question her sanity. The movie is a tense, unsettling exploration of perception and reality, touching on themes of mental health and the potentially thin line between sanity and insanity. It is also a film that really makes you question what's real, with the protagonist whose perspective is as unreliable as it is compelling. When a Stranger Calls is a film that's become almost iconic in the horror genre, particularly for its opening sequence. The story begins with a babysitter receiving chilling phone calls from a stranger who asks, have you checked the children? It's a masterclass in building suspense from the most mundane situation. The film then expands into a broader narrative, following the stalker years later as he continues his menacing ways. The psychological tension in this film is palpable, and it, and it plays in the very real fear of being watched and threatened in what should be a safe space. The film cleverly uses sound and minimal visuals to create a sense of dread, making it a timeless thriller. Triangle is a mind-bending horror thriller that takes place on an abandoned ocean liner. The protagonist, Jess, finds herself and her friends stranded on the ship only to realize they are not alone. The film takes a unique twist on the concept of a time loop, creating a complex narrative that leaves the audience piecing together the puzzle along with Jess. As the story unfolds, it delves into themes of trauma, guilt, and fate. The movie's strength lies in its ability to keep twisting the plot, offering new layers of intrigue and horror with each cycle of the loop. Censor is a recent addition to the genre, set in the 1980s during an era of video nasties in the UK. I don't know how to call them video nasties, bro. Oh my god. That's so funny. <laughs> that is like the most like British thing ever, bro. <laughs> the film follows Enid, a film censor who takes her job seriously, protecting audiences from the depravity of these films. Her life takes a turn when she watches a horror film that seems eerily similar to the mysterious disappearance of her sister. The film delves into the psychological effects of horror on the mind, so it's kind of like a meta movie, you know? It's a fascinating exploration of censorship memory and the power of film all wrapped up in this really stylish, atmospheric package, like Wes Anderson type stuff. I probably just pissed off like every Wes Anderson fan by saying that, um, uh, screw it, dude. The House That Jack Built is a dark, introspective look into the mind of a serial killer, Jack. The film is structured around five incidents across 12 years, which is, by the way, just I was gonna say, like, I love that film structure, you know? Like, um, biographical films that take over like a long period of time like Shawshank Redemption, Goodfellas, those kinds of films. I love them. Anyways, it's a film that's as much an exploration of art, architecture, and philosophy as it is a narrative about murder, which is pretty interesting. The psychological aspect of the film is intense, with the director, Lars von Trier, delving pretty deep into the psyche of his protagonist. The film is graphic, controversial, and unapologetically introspective, challenging the viewer's perspective of violence and art. The Fury is a bit of a cult classic, blending horror, science fiction, and a spy thriller. The story revolves around a former government agent whose son is kidnapped because of his psychic abilities. The film then becomes a race against time to find his son who's being used by a sinister government organization. What makes The Fury stand out is its use of telekinetic powers as a horror element, creating some really memorable scenes. Run Rabbit Run is a more recent psychological horror film that dives deep into a world of motherhood and the primal fears that come with it. The story follows a fertility doctor whose own daughter begins to exhibit strange behavior, seemingly influenced by an ominous presence. The film is a tense, slow burn thriller that uses the bond between mother and child to create a deeply unsettling atmosphere. It really explores themes of like grief and guilt and the lengths a mother will go to to protect her child. Weird there's a lot of mothers in this, in this genre, I don't know. The Girl with All the Gifts is a refreshing take on the zombie genre, set in a dystopian future where humanity is ravaged by a fungal infection. The story centers around Melanie, a gifted young girl who is part zombie, part human. The narrative explores the relationship between Melanie and her teacher, as well as the dynamics within a group of survivors. 
The film stands out for its character development, moral dilemmas, and a unique perspective on the zombie apocalypse. It's a thought-provoking blend of horror, drama, and science fiction, with a compelling young protagonist at its heart. The Hole in the Ground is an Irish psychological horror film that plays on the theme of changelings from folklore. A young mother and her son move to a rural town where her son encounters a mysterious sinkhole in the forest. Soon after, she begins to notice disturbing changes in his behavior, leading her to question his identity. The film masterfully creates a sense of paranoia and dread, with the vast, eerie forest setting adding to the atmosphere. It's a story about the fears of parenthood and the unsettling thought of not recognizing your own child, combined with folk horror elements. Which, I love folk horror. Um, folk horror iceberg coming soon, by the way, because I, lo I love folk horror, low-key. Yo, that was Lair 4, guys! How awesome was that? Let's get into Lair 5! The Cell is a visually stunning psychological thriller that takes you inside the mind of a serial killer. The story revolves around a child psychologist played by Jennifer Lopez who uses an experimental technology to enter the conscious of a comatose killer in hopes of finding his latest victim. The film is a feast for the eyes with its real and often disturbing imagery. It's a blend of science fiction and horror exploring themes of trauma and the human psyche. The way the film visualizes the inner workings of a disturbed mind is both fascinating and chilling, making the cell a unique cinematic experience. I'm sorry guys, I'm going crazy. A Cure for Wellness is a gothic psychological horror film that takes the audience to a mysterious wellness center in the Swiss Alps. The protagonist, an ambitious young executive, is sent there to retrieve his company's CEO, but he soon finds himself trapped in a web of sinister secrets. The film is atmospheric and visually captivating, with a sense of unease that permeates every scene. It delves into themes of obsession, sanity, and the dark quest for health and longevity. The movie's slow burn and eerie setting keeps you on edge, building to a climax that's both bizarre and thought-provoking. Why did I write it like that, bro? Why did I use edge and climax in the same- okay. P2 is a tense and claustrophobic thriller set on Christmas Eve. The film centers around a young woman who is trapped in an underground parking garage by a deranged security guard. What makes P2 stand out is its effective use of a single location to create a sense of dread and suspense. The movie is a cat and mouse game that's both frightening and frustrating, as you root for the protagonist to outsmart her captor. It's a straightforward but effectively executed thriller that keeps the tension high from start to finish. Silent House is a pretty unique horror film in that it's presented as a single, unbroken take, creating an immersive and real-time experience, which is really awesome, really, really cool. The story follows a young woman and her father who are renovating a dilapidated house when they find themselves trapped and terrorized by unknown assailants. The film's continuous shot technique heightens the realism and intensity of the situation. It's a psychological horror that plays on the fear of isolation and the unknown, making it a nail-biting watch. Would You Rather is a disturbing film that takes the concept of a dinner party game to a whole new sinister level. The story involves a group of people, each struggling with their own desperate circumstances who are invited to dinner by a sadistic aristocrat. They're forced to play a twisted game of Would You Rather, where the choices are life-threatening. The film is a commentary on human nature, desperation, and the lengths people would go to to survive. Kind of like Saw in a way. You Should Have Left combines elements of psychological horror with a haunted house story. The plot revolves around a man, his younger actress wife, and their daughter who rent a modern house in the Welsh countryside, only to discover it has disturbing secrets. The film plays with time and space, creating a disorienting experience as the protagonist's past sins and insecurities come to haunt him. It's a slow burn horror that builds an atmosphere of dread, with the house itself becoming a character in its own right. Images is a psychological thriller that delves into the mind of a children's book author who struggles with schizophrenia. The film blurs the line between reality and hallucination as she retreats to a remote cottage and starts experiencing terrifying visions. It's a haunting exploration of mental illness, brilliantly portrayed by Susanna York. The film's strength lies in its ability to keep the audience guessing what's real and what's a product of the protagonist's troubled mind. It's a deeply unsettling, yet empathetic portrayal of a person grappling with their own psyche. Possum is a deeply unsettling psychological horror film that delves into the realm of puppetry and childhood trauma. The story follows a disgraced puppeteer who returns to his childhood home, haunted by a sinister puppet and tormented by his past. The film's atmosphere is thick with dread, and the puppet, Possum, is the stuff of nightmares. It's a slow burn horror that cleverly uses its unsettling imagery to explore themes of guilt, repression, and the monsters we create. The film is a haunting experience, one that lingers in the mind long after it ends. 
Berlin Syndrome is a tense psychological thriller about a holiday romance that takes a dark turn. The film follows an Australian photographer in Berlin who has a passionate affair with a local man, only to find herself locked in his apartment. It's a story of obsession and control as the protagonist's dream getaway becomes a nightmare of captivity. The film is an exploration of the fine line between passion and danger, and it really, really like builds suspense, you know? And I think the title is a play on the Stockholm Syndrome, you know, because it's like Berlin Syndrome because they're in Berlin, but it's also like, you know, like a, like a Stockholm Syndrome kind of thing going on. Stockholm, you know? Blade? Stockholm Blade Sweden? Sweden? Fly Norwegian to Berlin, then come back to Sweden? Plastic surgery? What? Climax is a hypnotic and chaotic psychological horror film by Gaspar Noé. Set in the mid-90s, it tells the story of a dance troupe's rehearsal party that spirals into madness after their sangria is spiked with LSD. The film is a visceral experience with intense dance sequences, a pulsating soundtrack, and a disorienting narrative. It explores the darker sides of human nature as the dancer's inhibitions and sanity collapse under the drug's influence. Climax is an assault on the senses, a film that's as much a nightmare as it is a piece of art. Incident in a Ghost Land is a horror film that combines elements of home invasion and psychological thriller. The story begins with a mother and her two daughters moving into a remote house where they are attacked by intruders. But then years later, the daughters reunite at the house, confronting their traumatic past and questioning what's real and what's not. This one really follows um, the Haunting of Hill Houses story a little bit, like it reminds me of it at least a little bit. And that, if you didn't know, is, is my favorite horror thing ever. Um, so this one's I'm, I'm, I'm pretty partial to, I guess. The Forest is a supernatural horror film set in the... Okay, I'm gonna try to pronounce this. Aoki Gahara Forest, a real-life location in Japan known as the, um, Sewer Slide Forest. By the way, I got a, um, I got a lot of comments in my last video, the Humanoid Encounters one, about how I <laughs> pronounced a bunch of, like, Brazilian words wrong. <laughs> um, and, like, Argentinian words wrong and stuff. And, um, thank you guys for not hating on me for that, because I'm really white, and I cannot pronounce a lot of, like, words from other languages or anything. But you all were very sweet about it, so thank you. Anyways, the story of the forest follows a young American woman who ventures into the forest in search of her twin sister, only to be confronted by the tormented souls that haunt the woods. The film plays on the folklore and eerie history of, how can I say it again? Aoki Gihara, blending psychological horror with supernatural elements. It's a story of sibling bonds, guilt, and the haunting nature of grief set against a backdrop that's as beautiful as it is menacing. Possessor is a sci-fi psychological horror film by Brandon Cronenberg. It follows an agent who works for a secretive organization that uses brain implant technology to inhabit other people's bodies and commit assassinations. The film is a violent and surreal examination of identity, control, and the loss of self. It's visually striking and unflinching in its portrayal of violence, a cerebral horror that questions the nature of existence and agency. Possessor is a mind-bending journey, both disturbing and thought-provoking. The Rental is a thriller that taps into the fears surrounding home sharing and privacy. The film centers around two couples who rent a seemingly perfect vacation home by the sea, only to become ensnared in a web of secrets and mistrust. The tension builds as they discover they may be being watched, and the situation escalates into violence and betrayal. The film is a taut thriller that explores the dynamics of relationships and the paranoia of being under surveillance also in a location that shifts from idyllic to sinister. Yo, layer 5 is over guys, who's excited for layer 5 being over? Let's get into layer 6, we're getting kinda deep now. The Black Coat's Daughter, also known as February, is a hauntingly atmospheric horror film that weaves a tale of loneliness, possession, and the dark side of faith. Set in a boarding school during winter break, the story follows two students who experience strange occurrences, hinting at demonic possession. The narrative is non-linear, slowly revealing the connection between the characters in a pretty chilling climax. The film's strength lies in its mood and slow buildup of tension, complemented by eerie cinematography and strong performances, especially by Kiernan Shipka and Emma Roberts. It's a brooding psychological horror that lingers with you. Devil's Do takes on the found footage style to tell a story of a honeymoon gone horribly wrong. A newlywed couple experiences a series of disturbing events that lead them to believe something supernatural is affecting their pregnancy. The film plays in the fear surrounding pregnancy and the unknown, gradually escalating the suspense and horror as the due date approaches. 
It's a mix of domestic bliss turned nightmarish with a blend of mystery and supernatural elements that keeps attention high. Hide and Seek is a psychological thriller that delves into the world of childhood trauma, which if you've been on this channel for a while, if you're an OG, you know I love talking about and imaginary. Okay, that sounds really bad if you if you don't if you don't like know me. <laughs> I don't like childhood trauma. I just think it's really interesting how trauma from your childhood can affect who you become as a person and certain fears and fetishes and stuff. Anyways, this movie dives into the world of childhood trauma and imaginary friends. The film stars Robert De Niro as a widowed father whose daughter, played by Dakota Fanning, creates an imaginary friend after her mother's death. As her behavior becomes increasingly disturbing, the father must uncover the truth behind this mysterious friend. The film cleverly uses its psychological thriller setup to explore themes of grief, loss, and the fragile psyche of a child, culminating in a twist that redefines the entire narrative. Run is a gripping psychological thriller about the intense and twisted relationship between a mother and her daughter. The daughter, who has been raised in total isolation and suffers from various ailments, starts to suspect that her mother is keeping dark secrets hidden from her. The film is a tense game of cat and mouse as the daughter unravels the truth about her life. It's a story of control, manipulation, and the will to live, driven by powerful performances, especially by Sarah Paulson, and a plot that keeps you guessing. Seconds is a classic psychological thriller and a lesser known gem. The film revolves around a middle aged man who is given the chance to start a new life with a new identity by a mysterious organization. However, he soon realizes that this new life is not what he expected. The film is a haunting exploration of identity, regret, and the human desire for second chances. Its eerie atmosphere and existential themes make it a pretty thought provoking watch. Session 9 is a psychological horror film set in an abandoned mental asylum a perfect setting for a chilling story. The film follows a crew tasked with removing asbestos from the asylum, but they end up unearthing much more than they bargained for. The film expertly uses the creepy, claustrophobic setting to build suspense and a sense of impending doom. It delves into the troubled histories of the characters and the asylum itself, creating a tense psychological narrative that explores themes of mental illness and the past's haunting presence. Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me is a deep dive into the tragic story of Laura Palmer, whose mysterious death was the centerpiece of the iconic TV series Twin Peaks. Directed by David Lynch, this film serves as both a prequel and an epilogue to the series, painting a much darker and more disturbing picture of Twin Peaks and its inhabitants. And by the way, the show Twin Peaks is one of the best TV shows ever made. It's incredible. Um, go watch that. Like outside of this it's not like super like scary or like uh, horror or anything but it is just such a well-written show and it's like so creepy and mysterious it's a perfect it's, it, go watch that if you if you like this kind of stuff anyways this movie explores the last seven days of laura palmer's life providing a horroring look at the psychological torment she endures laura played by cheryl lee is a high school student leading a double life one of them filled with darkness abuse and supernatural encounters the film delves into her complex relationship with her father, Leland Palmer, and the demonic entity known as Bob, who haunts and ultimately controls him. The narrative is just classic Lynch, with surreal imagery, non-linear storytelling, and a haunting atmosphere. It expands on the mythology of the series, exploring the concept of the Black Lodge, a mystical place that plays a significant role in Laura's fate. The film is much more explicit in its portrayal of the abuse and trauma Laura suffers, which can be quite unsettling. Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me was initially met with mixed reviews, partly because it was darker and more intense than the TV series, and because it deviated from the series' more quirky and eccentric tone. However, over time, it has gained a cult following and is now appreciated for its pretty in-depth exploration of Laura's character and its contribution to the Twin Peaks universe. This film is a must-watch for fans of the series, as it provides pretty essential context and background to the events in Twin Peaks. Well, maybe essential is the wrong word, because it's not really essential. Like, the, the show you can watch without seeing the movie, you know? It's like a Better Call Saul situation, kind of. You know how, like, you can watch Breaking Bad, and you probably should watch it first, and you can still enjoy it without the prequel. But the prequel is still really good. Anyways, this movie is powerful and disturbing, and a really good portrayal of a, of a young woman's struggle against the darkness within and around her showcasing Lynch's unique ability to blend horror, mystery, and surrealism into a pretty compelling narrative. Okay, imagine being cursed by something that you can't even begin to understand. That is the nightmare Arthur faces in Arthur Male Addiction. The movie takes us on a journey with Arthur as he grapples with bizarre and frightening events that start to unravel his life. 
From eerie figures lurking in the shadows to unexplainable occurrences, Arthur's quest to lift the curse becomes a chilling exploration of the supernatural. The film really gets under your skin as you empathize with Arthur's desperation and fear, making you wonder how you would face such an otherworldly predicament. It's like really like Saul-like in that way, you know? John Carpenter's The Ward transports us to a 1960s psychiatric hospital, where the atmosphere is just as unsettling as the patient's stories are. Kristen, the protagonist, finds herself in this eerie ward with no memory of her past. She meets other patients, each with their own haunting tale, but it's the mysterious apparitions and strange noises that start to blur the line between reality and madness. As Kristen digs deeper into the hospital's dark past, the tension mounts, making you feel like you're walking the creepy, abandoned halls behind her. Mother's Day, dude, literally, th th there's so many about mothers, bro, what is going on? Mother's Day is a film that turns a family reunion into a survival scenario. When a group of intruders, led by a woman called Mother, disrupts the gathering, the family's home becomes a battlefield. The psychological warfare that unfolds is really intense as family members are pushed to their limits. The film is a wild ride of emotions, from fear to defiance, making you question how far you'd go to protect your loved ones in the face of such a terrifying adversity. Relic is a haunting portrayal of a family grappling with the grandmother's dementia, but there's a sinister twist too. When the grandmother starts exhibiting increasingly bizarre behavior, it's not just her illness at play, there's something malevolent lurking in the shadows of their home. The film beautifully yet disturbingly captures the pain of watching someone you love change before your eyes, blending this real-life horror with elements of the supernatural. It's both a heart-wrenching and spine-chilling experience. Tin and Tina may be a short film, but it packs a punch. The story centers on these two seemingly innocent children who refuse to eat their meal, but as the narrative unfolds, a darker side of these siblings emerges. The tension in their household is like really palpable, making you feel uneasy about what might happen next. It's a cleverly crafted story that leaves you guessing about the true nature of these children and the secrets that lie within their family. The premise of 12 Feet Deep is terrifyingly simple, yet effective. Trapped under a pool cover, two sisters face not only the physical challenge of their predicament, but also the emotional turmoil that comes with being in such a dire situation. The movie does an excellent job of making you feel the claustrophobia and the desperation of the sisters, as each attempt to escape is more nerve-wracking than the last. It's a story that makes you appreciate the freedom of the open air. It's like, it's, it's like you know like when you get sick, right? And you have like a stuffy nose and you can't breathe, right? And then once you get like not sick, you're like, oh my god, I can breathe. But then after a while, you start taking it for granted and you don't even realize it. You, and you, you don't realize how nice it is to have an open nose until you don't have an open nose. It's like that. Like you see this and it stresses you out seeing these two girls just like trapped. Set in a politically tumultuous era in Taiwan, detention is as much history lesson as it is a horror film. The protagonist students find themselves in a surreal version of their school where the horrors of their reality are amplified by supernatural elements. And as they navigate this nightmare, the film exposes the dark period of the white terror, making you feel the weight of the history and the fear it instilled in the students. It's a gripping blend of real world horrors and like not real world horrors. Marobone is a story that weaves family drama with ghostly horror. After the death of their mother, the Marobone siblings are determined to stay together no matter what. But as paranormal events begin to occur, their secluded home becomes a place of terror. The film masterfully builds suspense, drawing you into the family's plight and the secrets they hide. As the truth slowly unravels, you're left piecing together the puzzle of the Marobone family, feeling both their fear and their strong bond. Yo, layer six is done, guys. Let's get into layer seven. Super deep now. Bloodline is a chilling psychological thriller that delves into the darker aspects of family and legacy. The story revolves around Evan, a high school social worker and new father who harbors a dark secret. He's a serial killer targeting abusive parents. As he struggles to balance his family life and his murderous impulses, the lines between right and wrong blur. The film is a gripping exploration of the psyche of a man trying to reconcile his desire to protect children with his violent tendencies. It's a disturbing look at vigilante justice and the complexities of human nature. Okay, The Movie Braid is a mind-bending psychological thriller that follows two women who decide to rob their wealthy, mentally unstable childhood friend. To do so, they must play along 
with her twisted game, immersing themselves in a surreal world of make-believe. The film is a visually striking, hallucinatory experience that is, like, crazy. As the story unfolds, it becomes increasingly unclear what is real and what is part of the game, creating a sense of unease and unpredictability. Braid is a unique film that challenges perceptions and keeps you guessing until the very end. The Collector is a gritty horror thriller that centers on an ex-con's plan to repay a debt by breaking into his employer's home. However, once inside, he discovers another intruder has already rigged the house with deadly traps and taken the family hostage. What follows is a tense game of survival as he navigates the maze of traps while trying to save the family. The film combines elements of home invasion and torture horror, creating a claustrophobic and intense atmosphere. It's a brutal and suspenseful experience that keeps you on the edge of your seat. The Fourth Kind is a unique blend of science fiction and psychological horror, presented as a documentary-style narrative. The film explores the real-life phenomenon of alien abduction through the experiences of a psychologist in Nome, Alaska. Utilizing a mix of archival footage and dramatic reenactments, the movie creates an atmosphere of tension and mystery. The story delves into themes of memory, trauma, and the unknown, challenging the boundaries between reality and fiction. It's really cool documentaries are awesome and also i just finished the iceberg it's like over two hours about humanoid encounters so aliens are really cool to me in gothica halle berry plays a psychiatrist who wakes up as a patient in the mental hospital where she works with no memory of committing a brutal crime as she struggles to regain her memory and prove her innocence she's haunted by ghostly visions and a dark secret the film is a supernatural thriller that's, that combines elements of a murder mystery with the paranormal it's a story of redemption and uncovering the truth set in a chilling atmospheric setting that adds to the film's suspense. The Lie is a gripping psychological drama about how far parents are willing to go to protect their child. The story centers on two parents who cover up a horrific crime committed by their daughter. As they try to keep the life from unraveling, their moral boundaries and relationships are put to the test. The film is a tense exploration of family dynamics, guilt, and the consequences of deceit. It's a thought-provoking narrative that delves into the complexities of parental love and the lengths that one might go to in order to protect their family. Pinocchio's Revenge brings a horror twist to the classic tale of Pinocchio. In this version, a lawyer brings home a cursed Pinocchio puppet found buried from a child murderer, like with the murderer's body. Her daughter treats it as her imaginary friend, but soon violent events start to occur. The movie plays with the idea of whether the puppet is truly alive or if the horrors are the result of the daughter's troubled psyche. So it's kind of like, is it really a Pinocchio puppet or is it just the daughter like doing stuff, you know? It's a chilling story that combines elements of supernatural horror with psychological thriller. The Spiral Staircase is a classic psychological thriller set in the early 1900s. The story revolves around a mute woman who works in a mansion and becomes the target of a serial killer who preys on women with disabilities. The film is known for its atmospheric tension and suspense, as the protagonist must use her wit to outsmart the killer. The spiral staircase itself becomes a symbol of her journey to confront her fears and fight for survival. It's suspenseful and engaging, and it's, you know, it's pretty old, it's like a classic. Wounds is a psychological horror film that starts with a bartender finding a lost phone after a violent brawl at his bar. As he begins to receive disturbing messages and images from the phone, his reality starts to unravel leading him into a nightmarish world of obsession and paranoia. The film explores the idea of technology as a gateway to dark forces, creating a sense of dread and unease. It's a story that questions the impact of the digital world on our sanity, making for a disturbing and thought-provoking viewing experience. Barbarian Sound Studio is a psychological horror film set in the 1970s, centered around a British sound engineer named Gilderoy. He arrives in Italy to work on the post-production of a horror film. The movie is a captivating exploration of sound as a medium of horror. As Gilderoy delves deeper into creating the eerie soundscapes, the line between reality and the disturbing world of the film he's working on kind of starts to blur. The movie is a pretty unique take on psychological horror, focusing on the unsettling impact of auditory experiences and Gilderoy's disorientation and descent into paranoia. Truth or Dare is a supernatural horror film revolving around a seemingly harmless game that turns deadly for a group of friends. The plot kicks off when the friends are cursed by a malevolent presence during the game. They are forced to continue playing or face deadly consequences. The film intensifies as each character's turn reveals dark secrets and leads to terrifying challenges. It's a fast-paced horror that taps into fears of the unknown and the consequence of one's actions. 
of Unknown Origin is a thriller that follows the story of a man battling a rat infestation of his new renovated home. The movie turns this simple premise into a psychological battle of wit between man and beast. As the protagonist becomes increasingly obsessed with killing the rat, the film delves into themes of obsession, isolation, and the breakdown of sanity. It's a tense, claustrophobic narrative that showcases how an ordinary situation can spiral into a personal nightmare. Stillborn, also known as Blood Veil, is a track off the 2016 album by Swedish rapper Blake. Stillborn is a psychological horror film focusing on the trauma of childbirth. After losing one of her twins during childbirth, a mother begins to believe that the surviving infant is being targeted by a supernatural entity. The film effectively uses the horror genre to explore themes of grief, postpartum depression, and the fear of motherhood. As the mother struggles to protect her baby, the audience is left questioning what's real and what might just be a manifestation of her psychological state. Calvaire, also known as The Ordeal, is a Belgian horror film that blends elements of psychological horror and unsettling drama. The story follows a traveling entertainer who becomes stranded in a remote village and is taken in by a seemingly friendly innkeeper. However, the village and its inhabitants harbor dark secrets, and the protagonist's stay quickly turns into a nightmarish ordeal. The film is known for its disturbing atmosphere and the slow buildup of tension, leading to a climax that's both shocking and surreal. The Uninvited is a psychological horror film about a young woman who returns home from mental hospital only to suspect that her father's new girlfriend has a sinister agenda. The film is a remake of the South Korean horror film A Tale of Two Sisters, and combines elements of family drama with supernatural horror. As the protagonist investigates the girlfriend's past, she uncovers chilling secrets that lead to a shocking revelation about her own family. The movie is a gripping exploration of mental illness, familial bonds, and the haunting power of secrets. Fade to Black is a unique horror thriller that revolves around a film-obsessed young man who's shy and withdrawn. After being humiliated and rejected in his personal and professional life, he begins to lose himself to the world of cinema, particularly classic film noir and horror. He starts to enact revenge on those who wronged him, donning costumes and personas of iconic movie characters. This film is a blend of psychological thriller and a really like interesting homage to cinema. The Killing of a Sacred Deer is a psychological thriller with elements of Greek tragedy. The story centers on a successful surgeon who forms a bond with a mysterious teenage boy. As the relationship deepens, the boy's true intentions come to light, revealing a vengeful and sinister plot that threatens the surgeon's family. The film is known for its unsettling atmosphere, deadpan dialogue, and the moral dilemmas it presents. It delves into themes of guilt, retribution, and the choices one must make under extreme duress. Set in a post-revolutionary Tehran during the Iran-Iraq War, Under the Shadow is a horror film that combines the terror of war with supernatural horror. A mother and daughter are haunted by a malevolent spirit in their apartment as the city is bombarded by missiles. The film uses the horror genre to explore the psychological impacts of war and the struggles of living under a repressive regime. The haunting in the film becomes a metaphor for the traumas and societal pressures faced by the protagonists, creating a tense and emotionally resonant narrative. Okay guys, that is it for this video. This iceberg is super long, so I'm gonna do the other half of this iceberg in a different video. Be on the lookout for that one. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed, truly. Let me know if you enjoyed or not in the comments. You know, you know, it's YouTube, you know what to do. I hope you all have a really, really good night. Sweet dreams.